So uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, into the uh, occasional conversations at UCHRI, uh, Jody Kim and Grace Hong, who are uh, engaged in uh, convening a group on the necropolitical and the politics of life and death. And we thought we'd just uh, start with some um, discussion of what the group is doing, uh, the angle they're taking in relation to the question of the necropolitical. Obviously, it engages with some uh, well-established literature, um, um, but we don't expect that uh, that's all they're uh, engaged with. Um, and so I just want to begin by uh, asking you to lay out for us um, the range of issues and concerns that the groups engage with. Grace, would you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. Um, well, so yeah, it does. Uh, so the 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 topic does engage um, some pretty uh, well worn. Um, uh, set of conversations, um, particularly around um, the biopolitical, which comes out of you know Foucault, of course, and then um, you know um, various theorists who have taken up uh, Foucault's idea. Um, and um, the, but you know I think that um, what each of us in the group are doing, um, you know, both pursuing our own individual projects, um, but sort of collectively as a group, is thinking about. Um, the contemporary moment as a moment where um, the sort of dispersal and um, sort of uh, vulnerability to death is actually uh, becoming uh, sort of more uh, uh, ubiquitous rather than less, and imagining and thinking about um, other sorts of genealogies of theory. Um, that resonate with Foucault, um, but that um, but that um, can't just be subsumed to sort of the Foucauldian uh, line of thinking. So, for you know, so for example, you know, there are you know, uh, most of us um, sort of are interested in thinking about um, sort of um, uh, theories of decolonization, um, theories of race, uh, gender, and sexuality. Um, you know. Um, in my work in particular, um, women of color feminism is a sort of alternative uh, theoretical tradition for thinking about the dispersal of um, the unequal dispersal of life and death at the contemporary moment. Um, but you know, say Tu Hong Win Vo's work um, sort of engages with um, with uh, um, the um, the uh, sort of decolonization struggles um, and the aftermath of socialist regimes in Vietnam, right? Mm -hmm. um, as well as, you know, um, Jody's work and, you know, um, a number of different uh, scholars in our group who um, are um, sort of trying to excavate other um, usable traditions for um, the kind of necropolitical state of neoliberalism um, that can account for race colonization in intersection with gender and sexuality. So I, that's how I would describe yeah, it. Yeah, and so along with Foucault, reading scholars like Achille Mbembe and his theorization of necropolitics and um, the sites of um, the plantation and the colony mm -hmm. and um, Palestine in particular, mm -hmm. um, and even thinkers like Agamben um, reading them alongside um, indigenous scholars like Mark Rifkin and, and analyzing whether or not it's possible to indigenize scholars like Agamben in their theorizations of, of their life. Rifkin is an indigenous studies yes. scholar. He's right. not actually indigenous himself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and when you say indigenous, could you sort of spell out for uh, an audience who might not be familiar with what you mean so by So one of Rifkin's critiques of Agamben is that um, the focus on um, biopolitics can sometimes elide a, a similar focus on geopolitics as that plays out in the context of North American settler colonialism. Mm. And so in our discussion, one of the things that, um, that we thought about was you know, different ways of theorizing racism, so that race and racism don't drop out of this equation, mm. that one of the ways that we can think about this, if we, if we center the analytic of sovereignty, 
is that racism isn't simply the denial of political rights, but the denial of metapolitical authority, right, to certain groups. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and when you say it's a denial of metapolitical authority, I mean, it obviously plays out mm -hmm. in different ways in different uh, geographical, geopolitical mm -hmm. sites, mm -hmm. right? right? So uh, for indigenous folks say in the U.S., um, obviously the, uh, the sovereignty in certain regards, but the lack of sovereignty mm -hmm. in other regards exactly. becomes palpable. Right. Right. Uh, right. You know, in the case of... Uh, other peoples elsewhere. I mean, the the failure to be able to exercise political power in some instances at all, mm -hmm. whether it's a vote or whether it's uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. being able to exercise self-determination, uh, whether it's uh, the capacity to um, extend one's life by one's own means yes. rather mm -hmm. than Absolutely. at the Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So there are these various different sort of, you, you almost might say, instrumentalities by the way in which life is exercised. I wonder if you can talk a bit about that. Well, that's exactly, mm. you know, a part of the conversation we had around um, the Rifkin piece, mm. which is that he is um, theorizing this, this um, sort of uh, denial of metapolitical authority vis-a-vis -vis, um, the um, status um, sort of attributed to uh, natives in the con context of the U.S., um, which is domestic uh, dependent mm. subjects, mm -hmm. right? Um, or domestic Na dependent na nations, nations, right? And wards. Yeah, yeah, and we were, th but and then we were thinking, you know, that it would be um, a really sort of, you know, we were sort of thinking of other such um, related but very different historical categories, like so, for example, the unincorporated territory, right, which is like say Puerto Rico. Um, what were some other things? Here? Oh, um, Tu Hong Winvo was um, uh, was um, sort of uh, talking about the status of the refugee. Right. Um, and and, um, you know, the status of the parolee um, these um, legally and temporally liminal states. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then what were some other. Um, oh, the um, uh, Christine Hong um, was bringing up the um, the military camp town. Right. Mm -hmm. um, which is sort of. Um, you know, uh, neither and both under the jurisdiction of the uh, country, like say South Korea, in which they're located, um, and the U.S. military, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there are all of these different histories of the denial of um, metapolitical authority, or in other words, you know, um, the state's claiming of its right to um, establish an exception, mm -hmm. right? Um, that are very historically differentiated and that produce these, um, these uh, states of life and death. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. um, and so what is interesting is uh, not simply to characterize or define the necropolitical in terms of its uh, literal meaning, namely uh, the politics of death, yeah. mm -hmm. but also to think about how a politics of life relates to the politics of death. Uh, because obviously, you know, people live under very different conditions exactly, uh, right. and, and live different qualities of life. Mm -hmm. uh, and those different qualities of life then determine um, how, when, um, the duration under which death takes place, for example. So, mm -hmm. so, so death, of course, is always a relation to the living in some sense, right? Uh, yes. Sometimes a very negative relation to the living. Right. So mm -hmm. the... the the production of death, mm -hmm. right, and the production of death worlds, mm -hmm. the active production thereof, um, means, often means, um, the indefinite extension of life and the quality of life and the good life mm -hmm. for others. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, I've become recently interested in what we might call the necropolitics of debt, D-E-B-T. Mm -hmm and how debt is um, unevenly distributed. And mm -hmm. um, so that, for example, the US, in terms of its national debt, that debt is, has been called a debt imperialism that can be rolled over indefinitely. It doesn't mm -hmm. need to be repaid. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the whole global economy would come mm -hmm. um, crumbling down. But of course, other nations, other individuals, other families, their debts cannot be rolled over mm -hmm. indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And so given that that is the case, what do these different um, nations and groups of people, uh, what are they compelled to do? Mm -hmm. And so can you just spell out a little bit of how 
um, how that's connected to the question of necropolitical. I mean, uh, you know, obviously um, debt isn't forgotten uh, uh, so straightforwardly at the moments of death. Right. Um, or if you think of family debt, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, when the patriarch or the mm -hmm. matriarch, as the case mm -hmm. may be, dies, I mean, the debt continues to roll over, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, the debtors sort of come right. claiming, uh, claiming payment. So can you, uh, can you talk a bit about the, uh, the intricate sort of uh, ways in which um, debt and death are, are sewn together? Mm. One example um, that I have begun to um, investigate is um, the, the phenomenon of um, organ trafficking mm -hmm. um, and specifically cultural representations of organ trafficking. Mm -hmm. So because this is a, an illicit, you know, um, largely, not completely, but largely illegal, globally illegal mm -hmm. um, uh, practice, you know, we can find out a lot about it through cultural representation. Mm -hmm. So that's partly why I turned to that site. Mm -hmm. And um, what we find is that most people who are compelled to sell their organs, especially kidneys, mm -hmm. um, do so because they are in debt mm -hmm. or to avoid further debt. Mm -hmm. And this sets into place uh, a whole chain of events that renders them um, vulnerable really mm. to mm. Uh, premature death. Mm. Um, and and um, I'm analyzing a play called Harvest where um, there is a global US-based um, corporation. It's set in the near future. It was, the play was written and produced in the 90s, but it was set, it's set in 2010 and we've already We're, surpassed yeah. that point. But <laughs> so the, it's history. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but the young, the young man in this uh, play, who's the head of his household, um, basically signs away his life to this corporation called Interplanta Services. Mm -hmm. And he signs away not only a particular organ, but ultimately his whole life for these um, trans-racial whole body transplants that are possible in 2010. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and as you can imagine, the clients, <laughs> right, the clients mm -hmm. are privileged people from the global north. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and so what this um, work that Jody's doing, which um, we're actually uh, workshopping this week, and mm -hmm. we're I'm really excited about it, um, sort of demonstrates is that um, the condition um, that what we call death um, spans a number of different levels of existence, right? So, you know, of course, there's actual, literal, physical death, but um, there are lots and lots of different forms of, you know, what, um, you know, Orlando Patterson might call social death, you know, what might be called bare life, mm -hmm. you know, um, life in death, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so um, being mm -hmm. the subject of a certain kind of debt, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, could be a form of living death mm -hmm. that makes you uh, sort of vulnerable to premature actual physical death, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we're not just talking about the literal um, sort of relegation of people to actual death, but the process by which they are relegated mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. itself a form of death, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what that actually, what kind of, because, you know, otherwise this could get very depressing very quickly, right? What that sort of allows um, us to do is to think about other modes of possibility and political agency that um, in here in these states that we might call, uh, you know, death, right? That we might otherwise see as completely abject or victimized or what have you, mm -hmm. right? And you know, and and you know, and that's also for me one of the reasons why I go to culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is that culture is a sphere where you not necessarily but where one can have access to all of those things that are made unknowable impossible sort of illegible um, by um, these processes that can only recognize life both physical and social and mm -hmm. political um, mm -hmm. you know where are we going to find all of those things that are rendered unknowable, that are sort of, um, that are sort of um, uh, removed from our regimes of understanding? Mm -hmm. And I think culture, 
you know, is, is a really important site for that. And that's mm -hmm. where I think, um, that's where I think the importance of the humanities yeah, comes in. Yeah, right. I, I, I'm right. glad you raised that because yeah. I often characterize the humanities uh, when done at its best as translating ourselves to ourselves. That is, oh, that's in, oh, making, great. in making, you know, life around us including the life. I will cite you on that one. <laughs> yes. Or uh, death around us. Well, yes. death around us. I mean, life and death, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. as, as you're putting it. Yeah. Um, m m making those hidden, less obvious meanings, Absolutely. significance, values, uh, engagements with our world, uh, and so on, more legible to ourselves, mm -hmm. right? So this becomes a, a very good example of how one teases open the things that are just beyond either comprehension or even visibility. Absolutely. Right? And, and to bring them into uh, a, a presence, mm -hmm. uh, a presence of mind, you might say, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, you know, a greater comprehensibility uh, than one, uh, one, I mean us, than we might otherwise have. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps, you know, <laughs> I mean, a part of it is a greater comprehensibility, but a part of it is also about um, reminding us that there are just some things that we might not be able to comprehend, mm -hmm. right? I think that a part of it has to be a kind of exercise of humility in a way, mm -hmm. right? Like no, to sort that, of, that's well put. Yeah. You know, to sort of say, you know, um, you know, there are these processes, right, that certainly we as human beings instigated, mm. right, that affect us, mm. that determine life chances mm. in these incredibly brutal ways, mm. right? Um, but that um, a part of how these relations of uh, hierarchical power manifest and reproduce themselves is by making certain things unthinkable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, a, and, and our sort of ethical duty in relationship to that is to um, understand that, that there may be possibilities, but that um, our, our only way of attaining those possibilities might be to admit to ourselves that there are just certain things that um, are beyond our comprehension, mm. you know? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I like the way you put mm -hmm. that precisely because it speaks to how we um, um, identify, try to get at, but also admit that there are these things Absolutely. that are, are, are beyond our reach. Well, and, and to just to go with your your trope of translation. Mm. Translation mm. always exactly. implies an incompleteness, yes, and, and right. non correspondence. Right, right, exactly right, right. 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 Yeah. Uh, oh, I like say that. a bit more. I mean, say, um, you know, obviously when we translate, um, there's hardly ever, if ever, uh, uh, a literalness. Mm -hmm. uh, different languages, just to extend the metaphor, mm -hmm. uh, have different idiomatic expression that are not mm -hmm. isomorphic one with another, that um, figure different meanings within yeah. the context of the culture, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, so this, um, these slippages, these ambiguities, uh, these failures of meaning, right, mm -hmm. are all in themselves revelatory, mm -hmm. right, about uh, ways of being in the world. Uh, and indeed ways you might say of dying in the world. Uh, yeah. uh, there's this wonderful novel uh, I, you, you might know by uh, uh, the very good novelist, uh, South African novelist, Jake's, uh, 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 Zakes Bada, mm. uh, called Ways of Dying. Oh, that's um, great. Which is, well, it, <laughs> well, I haven't read I know. that. We, we need it, to read this. Well, what is wonderful about it is, is that it's a, um, a, a meditation on... Um, it, it, it's really a professional um, uh, sort of um, mourner, uh, uh, this figure of the professional mourner. A who professional go, mourner. Yeah, who goes yeah, right, you right. Know, from family to family, right, community yeah. to community, um, to, to express the, the mourning right, of, right. of their past ones right, uh, right. in the wake of the HIV AIDS crisis in South oh, Africa. Wow, right? It's quite wonderful. And, and, and his own loss of self yeah. and, and, um, you know, a, and the capacity to earn a living sort of, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sort mm -hmm. of in, in all of this. It's an incredible metaphor, mm -hmm. okay. uh, actually. So, so there one has sort of the ways in which, you know, a... Uh, a person and a culture respond mm -hmm. to what becomes 
you know, the, the social everyday. Mm -hmm. I mean, peop people yeah. are, you know, in, uh, yeah. certainly in the, in the 90s and, and into the early uh, 21st century, mm -hmm. um, were you know, dying many, uh, there were many, many, many deaths from, from mm -hmm. HIV AIDS in South Africa mm -hmm. on a daily basis, right? So, so at, at the very moment at which you would think that his career would get, right. you know, right. a, a, an uptick, yeah. you might say, uh, there's also the struggle for what this means in terms of how you live your life. So Absolutely. The again, the relation between the living and the dead. No, yeah. that's, that's fantastic mm. because, you know, to take it back to the translation issue, right? Of course, there is the sort of literal meaning of translating between languages, mm. right? But we can think of languages, you know, in a very broad and expansive way, mm. and especially the idea of a professional mourner, right? Um, because, you know, there's a certain kind of set of conventions around mourning and around expressing whatever it is that you feel around someone's death, mm. right? And that's a kind of translation mm. too, mm. right? Mm. Because mm. Exactly. you may be feeling something, but how do you express it, um, you know, in words or in actions or in gestures or in right. affect or feeling, right? right. Um, and um, so he is sort of the figure of a translator, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah, um, exactly. And, you know, and, and the idea of the slippage is that, you know, no matter what he's conveying, right? Or even if he wasn't a professional mourner, you know, even if you are the actual person who is sad, right? How you convey your sadness mm. in these various languages of mm. mourning mm. is never quite going to, um, you know, quite represent exactly, you know, right. how it feels and what it's like, right? right. Um, and so that, that seems particularly um, sort of prescient and it also, you know, your description of that novel also sort of highlights exactly the ethical demand, right? Which is that in this context in which people are dying, right? You know, um, how do you reckon with your, exactly. you know, your um, sort of access to modes of life, right? right? Yeah, and right. it's particularly sort of black and white right. when your professional career is boosted by somebody like other people's deaths, yeah. right? Yeah, but exactly. in a way, awesome. we're yeah. all in those kinds of economies, right? right? right. We're all implicated. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if there can be a figure that's a national, collective, public, professional mourner, so that it's not this issue <laughs> right. of privatized mourning of particular loved ones or right. family members. Oh, but, but I think that does yeah. happen. That's kind of yeah. what Benedict Anderson is saying yeah. about the Tomb of the Unknown Men's Soldier. Soldier. Uh, but then that that's not any better than the privatized. Yeah. It's actually yeah, it's really worse. This commemoration, terrifying, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, well, the uh, you know, uh, I mean that that sharp divide between the public and the private. Mm -hmm. So, so not all deaths are public, right? Mm -hmm. or, and, and not all deaths rise to the moment. Or count as deaths. Publicness or, or, count, or count as deaths. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the very point um, as well. I mean, I, I want to link this. Um, uh, in some ways to uh, the kind of militarizing of, of the social, right? Because mm. there, there's so many ways in which when one thinks about the world in which we live, um, the, the register of, the, of, of, of militarization, mm -hmm. not just as, you know, a, a material fact of life. I mean, that's mm -hmm. in some ways obvious. Uh, um, but as a, as a soci sociality, Right, we mm -hmm. wage a campaign, we wage a war, mm -hmm. we uh, we get wages. Right, I mean, mm -hmm. all these things sort of come together, and and this notion of the ways in which much of the technology we inherit in um, in public culture, the including internet. all of this <laughs> surveillance, uh, right, yeah. uh, it is a function of military R and D. Mm -hmm. I mean, the computer, mm -hmm. yeah. GPS. Mm -hmm. uh, motor cars, motorbikes, mm -hmm. I mean, you can go on and on, you know, battle fatigues that, yeah. you know, show up in MTV, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or, music videos. Or even videos like fabric technologies, right? Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so the pesticides. way in which... Um, <laughs> Chemical warfare, pesticides. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so the way in which um, uh, your militarization comes to consume us as we consume it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. The way in which then subtly and implicitly, um, a, you know, the necropolitical of the relation between the life and death mm -hmm. sort of takes on a register we don't sometimes even register. Yeah, right? so, uh, yeah. <coughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Well, I was just reading recently about drones mm -hmm. 
and how certain um, police departments, sheriff's departments have ordered um, drones for domestic yeah. law enforcement yeah. usage. Yeah. And yeah. so far, they're not weaponized. So uh, far. <laughs> so far, right? But who knows? Yeah, yeah. Um, Curtis yes, Mares. It's a slippery path. Curtis Mares, who is also in the group, um, is working on this really amazing yeah. book on um, farm worker futurisms. And, um, you know, this is a part of. Um, this is a part of his work. Mm -hmm. He's um, working on this uh, really amazing movie called Sleep Dealer, um, which sort of imagines sort of or imagined a lot of these things before they even started to actually happen, like mm -hmm. the use of drones. Mm -hmm. mm. So there was an interesting along those lines. Uh, uh, just yesterday, I think it was a report that um, as uh, Congress, particularly the House of Representatives, are seeking to um, restrict the capacity of the military to engage in propaganda mm -hmm. internationally. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've long been engaged in um, uh, that kind of activity to propagate mm -hmm. you know, American ideas, mm -hmm. ideals, values, and so, so forth uh, uh, around the world. So just as they, they're putting limits on the capacity to do that, they're trying in the very same bill, which is a, um, uh, the uh, you know, military budget, bill basically they're uh, trying to open up the possibility of um, uh, of engaging in propaganda in relation to american publics locally right? <laughs> so within so 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 propaganda which uh, has been um, uh, excluded from possibility on american soil uh. by two previous acts of congress mm -hmm. uh, are, are now right um the military can engage in uh, selling its activity. Uh, Domestic hearts and minds campaigns, exactly, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so there, uh, again, you see the sort of relation between a, um, uh, what, what is effectively uh, you know, instruments of, um, of war making and to some extent peacekeeping, but certainly of, um, of engaged violence on the, on, mm -hmm. on, on the one side. Um, sort of being brought into daily or potentially daily practice in in our ordinary lives as a way of shaping sort of how we think about our um, our social worlds, right? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, with implications of not just the extension of life and death, but but also how we live and how we die in some mm -hmm. sense, right? Mm -hmm. kind of, and and no doubt with a view to increasing the capacity of the military to attract people. Um, to come and mm -hmm. be part of it, right? Uh, yeah. To do its work for it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, maybe the the um, sort of places to go for critiques of that are the sort of communities that have always been militarized, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. so all the communities of color and, mm -hmm. you know, all the sort of colonized um, sort of populations within the U.S. Mm -hmm. whose entire experience of the U.S. state um, has sort of historically been sort of more the repressive versus the ideological state apparatus yeah. or both i guess they're always both always yeah. both yeah. yeah yeah it's true yeah. so yeah maybe that's the place to go you yeah. know um but yeah it's the thing about the militarization is really interesting because um you know you know what you were sort of saying about the sort of the 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 creeping infiltration of militarization um, I wonder if, you know, like, I'm thinking about what is the basic or the most sort of fundamental concept or idea underlying militarization, do you think? Y you know what I'm saying? Um, uh, in, in the sense of what? what drives a society to militarize itself or, or in the sense US of... U.S. militarism in particular? Well, I mean, or, you know, um, militarism versus what else? You know mm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's the sort of whole, uh, you know, uh, you know, like war is politics by whatever um, mean, uh, uh, yeah. other means, or is it the other way, or politics Politism. is war by other means? It's both. <laughs> so it's, it's both, uh, you yeah. know what I'm saying? So, you know... Yeah, class of it's war is politics by other means. By other means. And Foucault yeah. right. turned it around. Right. right. Politics right. is war by other means. Right. Maybe the, it's the nexus, the, the growing nexus between the military, I mean, and it's not a new idea, um, and, you know, capital. 
mm -hmm. right? That the military industrial complex. complex. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you know, but you know, because I think, you know, what then you know Foucault was kind of trying to say is that the sort of division between militarization and war and other forms of more maybe con consent driven mm -hmm. politics mm -hmm. um, needs to be interrogated. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, you know, if we think about militarism seeping through our society, are we then talking about more of a, an investment in, um, in uh, non-consent-driven -consent forms of uh, power? Or are we thinking about the ways in which uh, war and the military um, as a kind of apparatus of power is becoming normalized? Mm. You know what I mean? Those are kind of different mm. things. I, I'm, I'm not sure I'd, I'd place a contrast so much with consent, mm. because obviously consent has been variously manufactured mm. as Oh, no, as no, absolutely. And, no, no, uh, no, absolutely. And others have, have, have put it, uh, you know, uh, repeatedly. So that, um, but, but it's, a, it's a pressing question, I think, the one you're posing. So what, what is a contrast for the social, for a society that, that would, um, you know, you might say be demilitarized, right? So, right, because I mean, demilitarization doesn't necessarily mean that, like, the power goes away, right? No, right, exactly. In fact, it's just but, maybe more hidden because of this whole fiction of consent. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah I yeah. mean, the, you know, the one society that obviously jumps out of one as an example of um, a country that has no military is Costa Rica, right? Mm -hmm. and or Japan. Uh, to some extent, Japan, but I mean, Costa Rica seriously has no military. Zero. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, which is not to say they don't have a police force and that the police mm -hmm. force doesn't police its society in ways mm -hmm. of, uh, um, but, but the military socializes in a certain way, mm. right? So where there is a military, you know, um, um, either people aspire to it, uh, whether, it's, uh, whether it's poorer people in mm. order to be able to um, uh, get employment and work, or, or whether um, Adam Hochschild was talking today about the way in which the First World War on, on both the British and the German side of it um, was, uh, you know, that, that the largest proportion of people who were killed were, uh, were officers who were, you know, the, the sons basically of, um, uh, of, the, uh, of the upper and upper middle classes, right? Mm. Uh, that they were expected, you know, they were the captains and the lieutenants, wow, and they were leading, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and they were dressed very garishly, so they were easily picked off, <laughs> <by> <laughs> the snipers, and so on. It's so quite striking, yeah. actually, yeah. right? Um, and, you know, talking about the relation between military and fashion. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but, but um, uh, you know, so, so the military structures help, you know, and it doesn't always do it in the same way. Mm at different moments in time in different places. But it structures the social, right? And it structures yeah. how people think of their being socialized, the expectations that, you know, that they might go into the military and either be infantry people mm -hmm. or, or um, commissioned officers, mm -hmm. right? I mean, depending on what one's class background is and so on. Right. Whereas in a society like this, um, yeah, in part it becomes I mean, it's become more complex recently as well. In part, it's you know a, a form of employment for those who otherwise wouldn't be employed, mm -hmm. mainly yes. the, the poorer, Definitely. right? Uh, in in part, it's also um, a kind of proxy army because it's now also enabling people from elsewhere, namely Mexicans, maybe poorer people from elsewhere, mm -hmm. to to join the military without being guaranteed citizenship, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So I mean, again, yeah. it sort of structures the sociality the shape of the social mm -hmm. um, so for, for, for different societies. And so the, the, to come back to, to the question you're posing is, you know, how do we imagine the social outside of the frame, completely outside of the frame, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the limit, uh, the, the sort of thought limit, you might say, of, of not just the, the military, but right, of, right, of, of, of militarization as a yeah. logic. Militarized right? socialization. Yeah. 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 We were talking that in yeah. the group actually because um, uh, Curtis Mara's um, is uh, 
uh, working on one of the chapters on um, on Philip K. Dick's um, uh, Through a Scanner Darkly, mm -hmm. which is set in Orange County, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's a part of it where um, one of the characters goes through this sort of uh, kind of therapy slash drug rehab type program where um, that's sort of actually apparently based in a sort of a real mm. sort of program where they basically just hurl abuse at this person mm. until his entire psychic sort of infrastructure breaks down and then they remake him and we were sort of talking about how that's so reminiscent of like boot camp right mm. the sort of classic image of boot camp and to Hung was saying, but you know, it's a sort of mobile technology, right? It's certainly boot camp, but you can take it out. And mm -hmm. she said that this is something that, you know, say, like revolutionary re-education camps would use. Mm -hmm. And then obviously this sort of drug rehab program mm -hmm. might use. So schools, um, the schools. <laughs> yeah. um, so that sort of um, maybe, you know, another way of thinking about militarization is also about the production of certain kinds of subjectivities mm -hmm. out of, um, uh, a formation of like you know um, a, like like denigration, self denigration, mm. you know, and then um, reconstitution, mm. you know, and yeah, what what is an alternative pedagogical model, really, mm. Mm. right? And that we could institute mm. instead, and mm. hopefully that we are instituting. Hopefully, we're not doing that. <laughs> I don't know. My nephews are always playing those. Video. I don't know that much about it, but those video games—they're <laughs> all about yeah, war. combat. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Of one kind or another. Yeah. You know. um, yeah. World of Warcraft. Although you know, some have written. I mean, John C. D. Brown and um, and his collaborators have written about the way in which that game socializes sort of certain questions of uh, moral thinking and certain questions of collaboration mm -hmm. and certain so again you see the structure of uh, thinking the social through uh, the horizon of uh, of, of militarizing mm -hmm. um, i want to give you both an opportunity to say something in conclusion if you want if you uh, mm -hmm. feel there are things that you want to draw together um, to draw together. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I would like to thank you and UCHRI well, that, yeah, for that this opportunity. Have to be on camera, of Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Yeah. No, no. I mean, yeah. it is really. It has been incredibly uh, important um, to have the kind of time and space to uh, think about these things collectively um, in a really, really sort of. Um, sort of advanced and detailed way, right? Um, without sort of having to think about this in relationship to, oh, how, how am I gonna teach it? Or how am I gonna make it comprehensible to undergrads or mm -hmm. grad students or what have you? But to really just focus on, this is a, a sort of question or idea that we've been, that I've been grappling with for years or months mm -hmm. or what have you, um, help me out. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the people in our group have been amazing. And um, so it has been incredibly important. It has. It's been a sort of um, uh, the kind of experience you don't get anywhere else. So, yes, That's very good it's too. life sustaining. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good yes. notion, which do. Yes. And thank you so much for doing this and for having been here. Thanks. Thanks. Good. Thank you.